If you've ever played chess or even checkers, you know that the first thing that you have to do before the battle is to set up your pieces. Now in chess, your pawns are the first line of defense. They'll take the first hits and usually they'll make the initial attacks. Your second line is where your powers are, but also your vulnerabilities. Your queen is here alongside the king. Now a lot of people think that the king is a piece of action. But really the king represents the battle plan, mentality, the mind. The queen is the most powerful piece of action, but it moves to maximize the battle plan. If you destroy the mind that formulates that plan, then there's no more war. Thus, when the king is dead, the game is over. One of the most amazing things I see today is the mustering of troops. The gathering and positioning of pawns, rooks, knights, and bishops right in the open for those with eyes to see. Let's take the original man as an example. If things devolved into an all-out war, what troops would he have to fight? Well, let's start with the hired hitmen sanctioned by the state, of which the particulars I don't even need to explain because it's so prevalent. That's one enemy that would have to be battled. Then we have the immigrant contingent whose specific purpose is to replace the original man and woman. Also, we have the brain-dead Negro black man who still chooses to harm his brother in the middle of a war already in motion, not overstanding the need for absolute solidarity. Then we come to the very duplicitous European Karens. We got Karen Point One, who hates black men unless she can dominate and rule them. And also we have Karen Point One O who just hates black men, period, and will even interrupt his backyard barbecue, telling that she's going to call the police on him. Then the most painful of all, the divesting black woman, who has so much hatred for black men that they call them bullet bags. So there's already an intrastate army ready for the original man, should it get to that point. Now there are other antagonist protagonist forces logistically placed in combative position, but that gets much more complex and we'll save that for a later date. Colonizers used to lay siege to villages, slay the men and rape the women. Now the minds of men and women are so fragile that he can trick them into hating each other with media and skullduggery to the point that they commit race suicide all on their own, leaving each other for the promise of being able to partake in the treasures that he has looted and built from the world. Let's, let's go back in history here, okay? <laughs> you guys stood by us toxic white males through centuries of our crimes against humanity, <laughs> crimes against humanity, You rolled around in the blood muddy, blood muddy, and occasionally when you wanted to sneak off and hook up with the black dude, if you got caught, you said it wasn't consensual. <laughs> yeah, that's what you did. He can accomplish the same objective without so much as a bullet fired, and the susceptible minds are those with no regard for the scheme of the creator make them dive headlong into the sea of racial suicide. And make no mistake, the colonizer is well aware of the race suicide concept because for centuries he has fought it with much of his resources and social powers. But unfortunately, most people don't see the long game 
or too many people's spirits are broken. And the degree to which he has conquered their bodies, even more so now, he has conquered the minds of these same people. Incredibly, he has weaponized concepts that we still cannot grasp that can be made into weapons. Now what are these things that he has weaponized? He's weaponized peace. Living and working, growing together. You know, I really believed that once. I really believed we could change them. We did. Just because there's not a war doesn't mean there's peace. You want to teach your kids something, teach them that. Teach them to fight. Yeah. Peace is a weapon because while a war is being waged with feminized and buck break the black man, the illusion of peace keeps the vast majority in a frozen state, unable to act against the perpetrators of these horrific crimes that speak to the rest of the world of how easily the black man is bent over and ran through. We think these images are embarrassing, but not so much harmful when in fact, this is how you start the killing of a people. Study what Hitler did to the Jews. He has weaponized love. Yes, love. The word we think means cuddles and care only. Not overstanding, it means loyalty to the uniform that the Creator adorns you with. It means preparing a future for your children to live in peace. And if the world sees that you are in a subjugated state and you are unable and unwilling to secure your children, then any smart being knows you don't truly know how to love because you don't care enough for your own children to make the world livable for them. Love is weaponized when you love life so much that you're willing to live like an animal just to cling to it on a rock filled with insane trustees and wards of the asylum. People ruin each other's lives every day in the name of love because our concept of it is nothing close to what it really means. Why? Because the people who loathe and hate you taught you the meaning of it. The great Dr. Amos Wilson taught us that to warp and kill the mind, you have to turn the world backwards. You have to reverse everything. Justice has to be wrong and elusive while criminality is right and rampant. The hospitals purported to heal have to be places of death. Those who want to protect you have to become the deadliest danger to you. But you have to know these things and see with the third eye that this has happened. Let me give you a clear example. If you go out and a man runs up on you with a gun and tells you to give him your money, you know that's wrong. You run them do nonetheless, but you know it's wrong. And you would do everything in your power to make sure that it doesn't happen again. You would be more careful where you go, when you go, and how much you pay attention to, to your surroundings as you move. You would probably take two friends with you when you do travel, Mr. Smith, Mr. Wesson. And if you know anything about the streets, you know very few savvy people are robbed twice. They may get you once, but they don't get you twice. But again, we know this is wrong. But we're coerced into accepting that if we make a quote-unquote illegal U-turn, it's legal. It's right for a man to roll up on you in a black and white car with pretty lights and demand your money with a slip of paper. Stopping you because you're walking the street where there's a sidewalk provided, okay? That gives me a reason to stop and talk to you. But he has a gun too, right? If you run, he's going to blast you too, correct? It's essentially the same thing. Whether you want to or not, you're going to lose money as a result of this interaction. One scenario takes your money on the spot, the other gives you 30 days to run your jewels. And the threat to shoot you is apparent if you try to run. But if you're an original man or woman, it may not even take the running to be in danger of being shot. But that's another story. It just seems like two different forms of robbery, if you ask me, but what do I know? It seems we've been conditioned to accept one as legal and one as illegal. 
Legal means the person with the power gets to define the act how he wants, by the way, in case you didn't know. We see one as thievery and one as the law, but are they one and the same? Because if I'm not mistaken, the people who are supposed to embody the law have the most guns, the tanks, and a monopoly on violence. Ask yourself, what would the world be like without guns? Who would rule? Think about that. When you start to dig into the empirical meaning of words, you see the truth and things, believe it or not, get very simple. Legal, illegal, and the law are buzzwords that when you really look into them, it simply means those with the power to force their will on those without power. Here is something that should help you understand a social climate nexus, how certain things are connected to others. So-called black people are credited with playing the major part in putting the current ruler in the White House. So-called white people are blamed with trying to overthrow the government. On the surface, black, good, white, bad, right? But how about this? To prevent a tyrannical regime from taking control of the country and trying to poison the population, they, the quote-unquote white people, actually did what a people are supposed to do according to the Constitution. How about they blame and will direct their anger at the people credited with putting the tyrant in the house in the first place? On top of that, these same people, not savvy enough to have seen the mind game that the tyrants played, prove themselves either complicit in or directly involved in the destruction of their own people. We think warfare is killing with guns and bullets, but that's antiquated. The killing is done right in front of you. It's done by tricking people into slowly killing themselves or doing things that will cause their ultimate demise. When you see people denigrating their own communities, when you see the men and women of the same community openly expressing hate for one another, and you see mass race suicide occurring among people, most of this is not really ignorance. Most of it is people choosing a battle position, siding with who they think the winner is going to be. And this is not the first time it's happened. But even all of this, let's do a 360. There's still a good point. Or rather, there's still a good direction. There are new millionaires manifesting every day. The mind can be aware, but move to manifest your goals at the same time. In fact, knowing the critical nature of the need for a change can fast track you and fast track your efforts as long as you don't get distracted by the troubles. Just be aware so that when you do realize your dreams, they can't be taken away from you because you don't know who and what you're dealing with. I tell you what I say not to bog you down with lamentations but to keep you aware of the multifaceted levels of landmines and limit or eliminate confusion. As I said, people are becoming millionaires every day. If you become one, hopefully you will use some of that wealth to heal the brokenness running rampant within our community. Now that you know or that you know more. And I'll leave you with this. The day you understand the psychology of a person being able to smile in the face of someone that they loathe and despise is the day you will recognize the smiles and pleasantries for what they really are. Until next video, peace. If you learned from this video, help support the study in time to bring this knowledge to our community. It does take time and effort to be concise and as accurate as possible so that we can stay abreast of important health information and techniques. Please visit the site and follow these links.